The idea of sitting in a trendy Parisian bar in the 11th arrondissement, waiting for the author of many of the world's best-selling food books and the first ever food blogger could make anyone's knees slightly tremblant. But then our guest today walked in with a big smile on his face and said, bonjour. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by the best in the industry. David Leibovitz is known to every chef, home cook, baker, and lover of Paris. His blog, davidleibovitz.com, as well as many of his books, have been luring the initiated and old hats to discover some of the best that Paris has to offer. Now with the publication of his new book, Drinking French, just released today, his name will be forever synonymous with everything that goes into a glass, cup, or bottle in La République. I was on a mission to discover how he found shaking, stirring, and muddling instead of sifting, kneading, and rolling. I'm super excited to be here. I always kind of begin the same way about how, where people grew up and, mm-hmm. you know, their drinking culture and uh-huh. when and wh- <laughs> how they started drinking. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we begin there? Okay, well, there's a couple of, uh, they might not correspond to the subject, but in a way they do. I grew up in New England, um, and actually my parents drank, um, which sounds funny now, whiskey sours that came in a powder, and they would mix it, I think, with whiskey and shake it up and drink that. So they had these boxes with envelopes of powder in their uh, pantry, and they had some dusty bottles of Noily Pratt or some whatever they had. Um, and I remember once they had a party, and I saw, I was probably eight, and I saw a bottle of Jack Daniels, and I said, oh, all the adults are drinking alcohol. I'm going to take a big sw- That looks really good. And I took a huge swing of Jack Daniels. <laughs> And I just almost fell over. I mean, I just, I still remember, you know, it's probably like, you know, 50 years later. I remember that Jack, and I love Jack Daniels. Don't get me wrong, but. Um, we're talking yeah. the 70s here, right? With the packets? Uh, it's probably 60s. 60s. And actually they're still available because when I was doing research for drinking French, I kind of went online and saw that they're still being sold. So you can still buy drinking, you can still buy packets of uh, whiskey sour mix, and they also bought canned, they had canned cocktails. Right, I remember the canned, and I remember the bottle. Yeah, and, and I I'm sure they, they still oh, have the bottle. And you live in England, where they uh-huh. do canned gin and tonics, I guess. Yes, now, now it's a really thing. Well, I remember I was reading the girl on the train, and she kept drinking you know, one or two on the way home from work. I was like, cans of gin and tonic. Yeah, and then maybe I should move to back. England. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they were drinking these whiskey sours. Mm-hmm. And you took one big swig of Jack Daniels. Did that put you off of drinking? Not necessarily. You know, it's kind of like that first hit of a cigarette. You're like, <coughs> yeah. And then you sort of learn to smoke if you want to be a cool, you know, if you wanted to be past tense, a cool teenager um, or drink coffee. Even I remember drinking, you know, tasting my parents' coffee. And I was like, Ugh. Um, so you know, children don't really or shouldn't really have a taste for those things. Um, like asparagus for me. I remember oh. hating asparagus and then going back to it as an adult and thinking, oh, my God, I missed all those years yeah. eating asparagus. Why well, did that with lobster? You know, I grew up in New England and lobster was super cheap back then. Twin lobsters for eight ninety five, And I wouldn't eat lobster. I just it was like I didn't like the way it looked or something. I understand that. So. I was really stupid. And now when I go back to New England, all I want is lobster. <laughs> now you eat as much lobster as <laughs> yep. you can. Um, when do you remember starting to kind of drink and or enjoy drinking? Uh, well, there was a, there's an arc there, of course. You have teenager years, screwdrivers, Cape Cotters, you know, one of those, what do they call them? One in seven, five liter bottles with the jugs of liquor, bon- you know, mm-hmm. drugstore liquor, as you say. Was this high school or do you think well, college? Well, it was later, you know, it was in college. Uh-huh. Um, you know, frat parties, partying. Were you a beer drinker? You know, we sort of drank everything. Mm-hmm. What was funny was there was a, I grew up in a college, well, I went to school, rather, in a college town in upstate New York. And the bars would have like these all-you-can-drink nights. And I, I seem, oh, this is, God. this sounds really weird, but I seem to remember it being like $5, which is like crazy. This is in the 80s. Um, they were and, na- making no money from that. 
I don't know. I don't know why I remember five dollars, <laughs> but it's like turn. If, if only you know, I could find that place now. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we were drinking. You know, college students out partying and having fun. Um, but then I became an adult. I moved to San Francisco. I started working um, in restaurants and so forth. And you know, we would drink. But you know, we started drinking better, drinking, learning about wine, uh, drinking cocktails. I was in San Francisco, which is a little more sophisticated mm-hmm. than other places. Um, so there was some pretty good bars and so forth. You were working at a restaurant in Ithaca, right? Yes. And do you remember? Was it only wine with dinner? I mean, when you were serving dinner, right? We had a wine dinner. license, mm-hmm. you know, because a lot of every state in America is different. You know, of course, so I forgot about that. Yeah. Yes. So in New York, I think the restaurant I had, we had a liquor license, so we could serve wine. Um, you know, and actually, this is in the '80s, and a lot of people didn't really celebrate New York food, like lo- local food. That right. whole locavorism hadn't hit America. Um, and we were doing that. We were buying our vegetables from the local growers. We were serving local New York State wines. Um, you know, Vitus Labrusca. It's a kind. Of, it's a variety of grape that's considered not very good for making wine. Very juicy, mm-hmm. fruity. Um, but you know, ice wines were made there, and there was a really great culture of winemaking and there still is and there's also the cornell cornell university has an agricultural school right of course so you have this talent too of people who are studying how to make wine you know academically so that was kind of great and i learned a lot about wine just by drinking it mm-hmm. um, and also learned how to appreciate wine you know right in college you're just like it's got alcohol i want to drink it <laughs> you know course. when you get older it's like well i want to drink for taste mm-hmm. so and when you moved to San Francisco, was it still all about wine, especially when you were working, you know? At- it, it was because, well, I worked in a couple restaurants, but mm-hmm. I mostly worked at Chez Panisse. Right. And Chez Panisse didn't have a liquor license for cocktail, with alcohol. They just had oh. wine, um, which was actually good because over the years, they kind of thought about having a liquor license. Um you know, it's a way to make money. Of course, of um, course. That's how a lot of restaurants make yeah, most of their make money, money in, at right. the bar. Um, but they decided they didn't want people drinking heavily. And I think that's because Chez Panisse really followed the French Italian model of drinking, where you drink slowly, you drink aperitifs, you know, you have low alcohol ABV, right. low alcohol by volume uh, beverages, like before dinner, like an aperitif with ice like a red bitters or something, a vermouth, then you'd have wine. Um, and so also, they cut out that, that part, the aperitivo part. No, they have aperitivos because oh, you can oh, serve yeah, those. Oh, and um, it's wine, it's vermouth, of course. Right. So that um, uh, wasn't under the... Yeah, and the, also when I was at Chez Panisse, they didn't take reservations in the cafe, so people would wait a couple of hours. And having people drink like hardcore right. ca- you know, cocktails probably isn't a good idea when you have <laughs> They a get lot very of messy after yeah. the two hours. I was one of those who once waited in line. Yeah, well, I so remember I the that. first time I ate there, I, right. we drank wine for two hours and we sat down. I was kind of a little woozy. Well, you you were in the back of the kitchen, mm-hmm. I guess because there was not no cocktail making, I guess no bar per se there. Well, actually, though, I worked, I started working upstairs in the cafe and I was actually, my station was right next to the bar. Ah, so I was there. So for you the were action. there. Yeah, yeah. And did you ever think either they're having an easier time with it over there and no. they get to talk to the, the, the punters, as we say? You know, they were the, working hard. You know, I worked. Everyone, I, I know everyone yeah. worked hard at Chapin East, so saying yeah. that, yeah. I, you know, I I never... The only thing I actually glamorized were the people who worked in pastry, because I used to see them making cakes and stuff, and I was like, I want to do that. They're just making cakes all day and baking cookies, <laughs> and that's then cutting so up fruit. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to the pastry department. Right, from salad to pastry, yeah. right? And it was a different vibe, you know, there's different stress involved. Um, of course, because... Yeah, I, well, you know what's funny is that I know you've said... When people say, oh, I can't bake, and then you mm-hmm. say, it's just, you know, you just follow the recipe, it's not that easy. Because I feel that about a Negroni, that I can try, I know it's a third, a third, a third, mm-hmm. but somehow it always tastes better when a great bartender makes it. So obviously, yeah. I think you're being nice about the, anyone can bake. <laughs> well, one thing that's interesting is in the pastry department, we had a liquor cabinet, and the pastry chef was the owner of the restaurant, executive pastry chef, Lindsay Shear. She was very influenced also by France and Italy. So we had all these liquors that we used for cooking. So that was where I discovered things like Eau de Vie, Chartreuse, Grand Marnier, Cointreau, Kirsch, Cognac, Kirsch. Kirsch. Um, you know, we used to use all those things. And 
you know, the good thing about Chez Panisse is money was no object. Like the, the restaurant was never about mm-hmm. making money. Um, you know, they spent a lot of money on food costs. So that was fine. Um, so I learned about all these liquors and it was great because we could use them lavishly. Make, let's make champagne, you know, uh, sorbet, you know, and, or sor- sorternes, you know, Paris potion sorternes, opening four bottles of sorternes. <laughs> and just okay. did, oh well there's a little bit left we'll just yeah, drink that but right? the owners insisted like uh-huh. they were the ones that wasn't us scale let's use the liquor right so um and we also drank well there you know we drank good wine and and were they, you you know you're spending your they call this a bus men's holiday were you also cooking for people at home no well, never never no never because i worked every right. night and when it was funny because on my nights off, the only place I could eat was Chez Panisse because I couldn't get a reservation anywhere <laughs> else. <laughs> um, it was kind oh, of you funny. Poor thing. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, it was just it was just kind of funny. My friend, you know, I had a few friends, not that many, because I worked in a restaurant. Um, but it was like, well, let's go to. Do you mind going to Chez Panisse? And you know, we could get in and so forth. Did Actually, you- now I can't get in. Last time I was in San Francisco, I couldn't get it. I'm sorry. If you work there, you have to. Yes, they should always. It should be like house seats. You know, you always can call the day before. and and, There's only, you know, restaurants. I also learned there's only only so much a restaurant can do. When a restaurant says they're full, they're full. So. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Now, the drinking side of it, would you haunt bars in in san francisco was it yeah. a well you know was that a way yeah. what well, first you know i had arrived in san francisco you know being gay it was like gay bars everywhere you know of course i worked every night but after work i could go out and we also we'd often go out as a group at chez panisse or sit around and have wine with staff meal at you know twelve thirty at night or we'd go bowling and have beer um or I sometimes might go out with friends late, you know, hit the south of market, sort of the sort of seamier side mm-hmm. of San Francisco, shall we say. Yeah. Um, or, you know, on my nights off, I would go to bars with my friends, drink, you know, mostly drink beer at gay bars. Um, you know, if you order like a glass of Chardonnay, they're going to bring out the gallon jug and, you know. <laughs> Wicker <laughs> and or the glass yeah. Lambrusco. Yeah. Or... yeah, and it's fine. You know, you're not going for a refined experience. Um but that was, you know, that was how I drank then. And um, at some point, though, somebody at Chez Panisse in the kitchen, I think it was Jeffrey Stouffer, who was one of the one of the world's great cooks, and he quit eventually to become a financial consultant. Um, but he started bringing in Bombay Sapphire gin, and we'd have martini nights, and we'd play music like jazz music, like lounge music, and we sort of it sort of became our ritual to have martinis after work. Uh, so. And of course, we had the vermouth from the pastry department. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and a couple uh, olives around. Oh yeah, the we lemon. had all this stuff. Yeah. The lemon. yeah, we had mm-hmm. snacks and stuff. Mm-hmm. So that was fun. So when you got to Paris, mm-hmm. is that when you discovered like aperitivo time and that kind of drinking? Uh, sort of. Um, you know that, and also traveling to Italy because in Italy it's much more. You know, you just, you actually use the word aperitivo. Um, you know, they that's sort- really nice speak Italian. So well, they also like- inv- you know, I don't want to say they invented that genre, but it's very big there. They call it aperitivo, whereas in France they say happy hour, or oh, they don't really say aperitif time. Um, at somebody's house, you'd say l'heure d'apéro, the aperitif hour, and that's usually the time when between when guests arrive and when you serve a meal. Mm-hmm. So you have like some drinks, something to eat, you know, snacks. Um, but it's fun, like while you're here in Paris, if you go into a supermarket, they have these huge aperitif aisles. They call it, sometimes they call it salés, like salty stuff. Sometimes they say aperitif or apéro. Um, it's kind of the French are really into like salty snacks, like potato chips and peanuts. And I know I saw that in your book, which we'll yeah. come to in a second. Um, and, you know, afterwards, I was thinking, mm. before I get on that train, I want to go to the supermarket, this one down the street, yeah. and check out. The Marche U. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's good, you know, and a lot of the stuff is good. They have pistachios and cashews. Um, it's kind of, it's sociable food because yeah. you know you're going to be sharing it yeah. with people over drinks. Yeah, and I love potato chips. I don't eat them that much because a friend of mine worked for Jenny Craig. And he said the first thing they would do oh, is no, don't tell me this. dump a bag of potato chips. Do you want to hear this? No, no, go on. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to stop you. dump a bag of potato chips into a blender or food processor and turn it on. And it was like it would make this oily sludge. I was like, I'm not eating potato chips anymore. So the good thing about that, having that memory is I eat them 
cautiously. You know, I eat them. I don't. I used to. You know, when I worked in the restaurant, I would go home and eat a bag of tortilla chips, and you know, in front of the TV and watch Charlie's Angels reruns or The Love Boat. You know, now I can't do that. You know, in my early sixties, so I can't eat bags of chips. And but, there's you know, no Love Boat and Fantasy Island on TV here either. No, but there. I think I would watch it though. If it yeah, were on I, there, TV sometimes here. you can find it, but it's dubbed and oh, yeah. lose. You know. Um, it's funny what you say about potato chips because I always think that that is the what Italians serve with when you get to their yeah. house. That is that yeah. is their aperitivo yeah. food. Yeah, I've been to so many dinner parties there, and literally that's what they serve with their yeah. drinks is always potato chips. Yeah. So I tend to do that. I'd love to do that as well. I just think, oh, I'm not going to get people full. I'm making a dinner for them. Yeah. A little bit well, of potato that. chips are, you know, they're really good. <laughs> They are really good, and there's about a billion flavors in England. Yeah. But back to drinks. Um, well, you can't talk I, about drinks without food, so ah, it's nice to have something to eat. Somebody actually in yeah. Italy, I was in Luca, and I was shocked, you know, when they brought all this food. You know, when you have a drink, like, can I get a spritz? And they bring, like, dinner. And, you know, in a right, cafe. Right, of course. And you're like, I didn't order that. And they're like, oh, in my Italian friends, like, well, you can't drink without having something to eat. It's so much nicer, isn't oh, don't it? Don't tell the Brits that. There are many. Yeah, yeah, well, the, yeah they want to drink. But. Well, yes. And in the cocktail bar, sometimes they don't have anything to go with it. And you say, you know, do you have nuts? Do you have any, you yeah. know, pretzels, anything? Well, they don't know? do that at cocktail bars here in France. Uh-huh. They do that like in cafes. If you, you know, if you order a drink, uh, if you order like a kir, you get those. But if you order like coffee or something, you don't. Right. Like, can I get, I really All right, want the okay. peanuts. <laughs> All right, I just want the chocolate. I want the yeah. salty stuff, even with my coffee. Um Obviously, you've been so prolific writing about food mm-hmm. um, coming from that background. Why did you decide to write Drinking French? Why did you decide to write a, a book about uh, drinking? Well, a couple of things. One of them, I was at a bar, t- bar one night because Paris, the, the cocktail culture, all, you know, in the last five to ten years has really gone up like a lot. Like mm-hmm. the quality is great. There's amazing cocktail bars here. And there's, of course outstanding spirits and liquors in France. And I was watching a bartender mix a drink and I saw, you know, them putting one ingredient in, then another, there were different ingredients. One was alcohol, you know, hard, hard, high, higher proof alcohol. One was something lighter. And then they're saying, squeezing some lemon juice and then they give you a drink. And I was like, this is exactly what baking is. You put these ingredients together and you make something else that highlights these things. So that, that part of, you know, I was like, Oh, I want to learn to do that like they do, which was harder than I thought. I thought I'm going to learn to be a bartender and we can circle back to that later. But the other part of the equation was no one had ever talked about French drinking culture. Um, Even French people now, when when I'm telling them I'm writing this book, they're like, oh, 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 hmm, oh, yeah. yeah." Um, You know, they just take it for granted. And but people come to France and the drinking culture, you know, there's cafes everywhere. You know, I, when I travel, I'm always like, I want to have a drink. Where can I get a cup of tea, you know, or coffee or whatever during the day? And often there's nowhere to go. And that's one of the things that Starbucks gave Americans. For better or worse, people criticize them, but they actually gave, brought back, you know, we used to have diners. Mm-hmm. They brought back this culture of places to gather and then other people jumped in and i'm sure i'll get some hate emails about that (laughs) no i was (laughs) in iceland and this was Uh, years ago at least 10 12 years ago and we were hungry and mm -hmm. we're outside Reykjavik, and there was no place there was a truck stop Mm -hmm. and then a supermarket and that was it and i thought oh we're so used in england or new york we're so used to places that you can just pop in and get something where a lot of the rest of the world they don't have this. Yeah, well, they don't snack. Um, and it's funny because I was explaining to my partner who's French. I said, well, you know, we're, we're animals and we're actually meant to eat that way. We're not supposed to sit down. You know, squirrels do not sit down and have three meals a day. Um, so he was looking at me like I was crazy. But it actually makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know, you're supposed to hunt and gather. And they always uh, say the best diets are when you, oh, you eat six times a day, little bits, yeah, that kind of thing. That's kind of how I eat. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyhow, I wanted this, I thought this culture of French drinks was so interesting. Um, cafe drinks, you know, what is all these traditions? Like just ordering a cup of coffee at a cafe in France tells you about 10 things about the culture. You know, it's about the, the place, the drink, the people around you, the people behind the bar, 
um, and so forth. So there was so it was such a rich part of French culture. These traditions, I was like, I need to write about this. And as tourists, we don't even know half of what you can order. I do know that in Italy, uh-huh. we just we don't know. You know, all yeah, the yeah. different coffees, I mean, all the different everything. Exactly. Well, that's another thing. You know, you, people would come visit France um, and they would see all these bottles behind the bar. And I wanted to explain what those were. Like, what is, you know, beer, B-Y-R-R-H, you know, it's like, oh, that's it. We're at Dirty Lemon Bar in Yeah, Paris, sorry, guys. People are on. No, it's great. People are calling <laughs> Call for <it>. reservations. So <laughs> we don't have the reservations. Yes, I didn't know. Beer, B Y R. Yeah. I didn't know it. Yeah, or you know, Bonal uh-huh. or uh, Picon la Mer, and you know, French people add that to beer. You know, and people would come to France like, "What is that red drink they're drinking?" Mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh, that's a Monaco." You know, it's got grenadine in it and beer. And they're like, "That's weird." Yeah, because yeah, Americans yeah, yeah, yeah. are. Used to, but you live in England. There's such. I think they call it a shandy, mm-hmm. which in mm-hmm. French mm-hmm. is a panache, and it's a great drink. Mm-hmm. You know, it's lemon soda with beer, right? So you can drink more, and you're not like drinking a giant beer. Um, so all those traditions came together for me. Plus, you have this amazing culture of making liquor and spirits. I mean, you have chartreuse, which has a thousand year history. Yeah, you know, it's it's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Their history, yeah, how yeah, it took them. I know they were growing it, they were distilling it. Yeah, well, I, I feel uh, yeah. it was like, yeah. and they were places burned like down, they were kicked mm-hmm. out of France. Oh, yeah, the yeah. chartreuse, yeah, yeah specifically. Just, yeah, specifically. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, you have cognac, and, and all those things also come with rules and regulation. Like cognac, there's a distiller, uh, Maison Ferrand, and you can only use your stills a certain time of the year mm-hmm. to, be, to be called cognac. And the owner petitioned the government to let him make gin the rest of the year. He's like, well, my stills are empty. I want to use them. And that tells you a lot about French culture too. Mm -hmm. The way everything is very regulated and formulated and there's not a lot of margin to change. But now you have these new people that are changing things. um, Thomas Deck um, or uh, Deck and Donahue, they make a beer and mm-hmm. I said, was it really hard to get a license? He goes, no, it's actually super easy because um, you're brewing. You're not cooking anything. You're not heating stuff up. Mm-hmm. So. Now, when you saw that bartender, about how long ago was this? Oof. Maybe it was like eight years ago. Uh-huh. Or... Did you then go home and try your hand at it? No. Was there? No. No. Okay. Um, I didn't drink a lot at home then. I didn't have a, you know, a stocked bar. I had a few bottles. Now I have like 200 bottles. <laughs> and it's I've just given you bad. another bottle. <laughs> yeah. And I had a couple of bartending uh-huh. lessons from friends of mine. Uh-huh. Um, one of the gratifying things about doing this book was these people who are really amazing, like world-class bar people were so helpful to me. Like they loved me. They, uh, you know, often think, you know, you're scared of that person. They're behind the bar. They're cool. You know, the women are like, you know, making these drinks and they're flipping the bottles and, and they're pouring. shaking stuff and two yeah. hands. And yeah. yeah. And then the men are, you know, Hey, what, what can I do for you? And I thought I was so like, and they'd make it look so easy. Yeah. And so they helped me with recipes. They helped me. They would come behind the bar. I'm going to show you what we do. Mm-hmm. It's like, this is so, was there cool. one cocktail that you really wanted to make and get um, right? N- I, uh, there was a few, there were a few, I should say. Um, I learned a lot, you know, like uh-huh. I learned, I was with Jeff Gali in Brooklyn and we were working on the, the cocktail, the Brooklyn. And I was, we were talking about Manhattans. I go, why are your Manhattans so good? And he's like, well, here, I taste this one made with Rittenhouse and, um, you know, the Carpano, what's mm-hmm. the, it was a, no, a Rosato, I think it's called. I'm not an expert on Italian liquors, but there was a red Italian vermouth that he used and then he made one with like old overhaul, which is fine. Mm-hmm. And then some other vermouth. It was two completely different mm-hmm. drinks. Um, and I realized, wow, there's a lot to this that I don't, I, you know, I don't know about so much. And I wanted to learn. I wanted to be an expert on these things. Mm-hmm. So I had to become an expert. Um, so I don't know all. I know all about French liquors, Italian. I, I guess that's my next book. <laughs> <laughs> and when you started, did you already think I have I have drinking French in mind as a book? This is something yeah. that could be a book. Well, what was interesting was I um, I had finished the book My Paris Kitchen, mm-hmm. and I had just finished a very very difficult period of my life renovating my apartment, and I was walking down the street one day, and I said I need to write a book about 
what happened during the apartment. Right. And so I had these two ideas in mind. So we actually, I brought them to my publisher and I signed a two book deal. And I said, well, you know, I think I should do the apartment book first and then the drinks book because the apartment book was sort of heavy duty stuff. You know, it was a heavy subject, but funny. Yeah. Um, it wasn't funny at the time. It was funny in retrospect. <laughs> and then Those the, things are. The, I thought I'll do the drinks book because that's more up. And so I did that. Mm-hmm. And I was going to say, did the apartment drive you to drink? Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, the apartment drove me. Well, you know, I wasn't drinking that much then because it was so... If I if I had drank then, it would have been not so great because it was a it was a pretty rough situation. I, drank, I ate a lot of hamburgers, mm-hmm. which I talked about in the book. Um, but I mean, drinking to me is not a place where you, you know, look for solutions to your life. Or drown your sorrows, I Yeah, guess. exactly. Uh-huh. It's a place to... It's it's a thing to enjoy. Mm-hmm. I, like I love drinking. I don't love getting drunk. So um, in spite like, of yes, my I think most years, people feel that way. Yeah, and when um, if I I don't like that feeling anymore. Um, uh, do you, you said in some I, I think in something that I read that you that the French go out to dinner. It's not really about the the restaurant itself. You know, the best or right. this. It's about getting together with friends. Right. Do you think that also translates into drinking as well Absolutely. for the French? Uh, well, I was actually just thinking, I went to a dive bar with a friend in New York um, who's actually writing a book on dive bars, Brad Thomas Parsons, um, who's sort of the godfather of drinking French because he's a very well-known, uh, brilliant cocktail writer, spirits writer. Um, but we went to like dive bars. I had a bourbon with a shot of ginger ale on top. Um, and he ordered for me. And so it's not necessarily about the quality of drinks. It's where you are and who you're with, um, which you just mentioned about food. A French friend of mine said, you know, we don't go out to eat for the food. We go out to be with our friends. And that's true. If you walk around Paris at night, um, you'll see a lot of people in sort of just hole in the wall cafes. And they're not drinking fine wine. They're not drinking artisan beer. They're just drinking draft beer and they're drinking, you know, whatever wine they're being that's being poured. So it's about being convivial, um, being with friends. You know, a lot's been talked about the quality of coffee in France. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it's sort of, you know, I wrote about it, I think, in 1997, um, which started uh, started a... uh, uh, some discord in the world community because it was kind of the emperor's new clothes. Then the New York Times a year later wrote an article about it and that everyone's like, did you see this article? This is really, what do you think? I'm like, I wrote about it last year. So, <laughs> you know, now, but it, what it did was it uh-huh. improved the quality of coffee. All these young people were ne- here at Dirty Lemon were next door to Cafe Mary Court. Um, and the owners in my book, because um, he opened these two wonderful neighborhood cafes with really good coffee. And this good coffee now in France. Mm -hmm. Well, coming back to the book, were there, what, what were the surprises that you found out that you didn't realize or was everything a surprise? Everything was a surprise Uh because um, it was funny because I was a martial artist most of my life. And yeah. And I studied for quite a long time or practice. Which martial art? Um, I started with karate. Then I went to Korean um, style martial art called Kok Sul Wan. And then I became an Aikidoist. Uh, because I got older and you, know, you calm down. Um, but I learned the white belts are the best students because they're fresh, they're new. It's, they don't have an ego. Mm-hmm. So I went into this book as a white belt. I was like, you know what? I don't, don't want to come in with preconceived notions. So I went, I remember I went to Dolan, which makes vermouth. Mm-hmm. Dolan vermouth. Chambre. And Chambre. Yeah, yeah. And the guy was super nice. He, you know, he answered my email right away. Very, you know, very, you know, it's like, wow. And... I went there and I was expecting to be in this huge place because it's world famous Dolan Vermouth. And 20, they have 20 employees. He was sitting in the office. Um, they do all this stuff there. And he just took out, he had all these like vintage bottles on the shelves and he was showing me them and telling me these stories. I was like, nobody knows this. I was like, and then he took out these ledgers that were written with quill pens, you know, with, or quill, I guess they called them pens. And all the recipes, you know, for all these botanicals. And I said, you know, I I need to take a picture of the penmanship. Do you mind? He goes, no, what do you do? Make your own vermouth, you know, start your own company. (laughs) But so great. So the surprise was meeting people like him and also seeing that a lot of these things that we think are big industrial products 
aren't necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, even Noilly Pratt Vermouth, made in the south of France, they leave the all the barrels outside um, to get oxidized a little bit because that's the taste of the sea. That Noilly Pratt, the mm -hmm. wine used to be shipped from Spain, so it arrived sort of oxidized a little bit, a little salty. Um, and they were recreating that, and you think, oh my God, here's this worldwide brand, and they're putting, <laughs> leaving the barrels outside for a year. You know, that's... And they're all out there. They're all, what? you know, just sitting there. And it's kind of great. Mm -hmm. um, so all that stuff I learned, um, everything was a learning experience, but fun and mm -hmm. interesting. And um, How about being a bartender? What was a, that like? Uh, well, uh, you know, I actually said to a bartender, I said, well, I don't know if I could be a bartender because I don't like being sticky. Like my hands. <laughs> he goes, well, if you're doing your job right, they won't be. Um, Ooh, and, that's you know, like a task. Yeah, well, that's yeah. true. And I learned, you know, I was trying to learn the speed pour where you flip the bottle oh, yeah, over yeah. with your fingers. Um, and Jeffrey Morgenthaler, who's a quite well-known bartender mm -hmm. in Oregon, he wrote a book called The Bar Book, which is a great book. Anybody interested in yeah, he's great. Bar even bartenders, like, that's the first book you should read. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to learn the speed pour, and I, and I couldn't. Then I realized I'm never going to have to use this because I'm never going to work at a bar. Um, and I wrote to him. I was like, Jeffrey, it's not working for me, the bottles. Um, so I did. You know, you don't have to be a home. You don't have to be fancy. Um, I use an OXO measuring cup now. Those little, you know, mm -hmm. they're really good. You can see it. You have a good cocktail shaker. I don't have. I bought some of the Japanese equipment, you know, to, to be cool. But you don't really need that stuff. Yeah, um, well, you know, the three-piece shaker is really easy. You don't even have to, like, bang it. You know, yeah. the two-piece can get difficult if you don't really know yeah, how the to two take piece, it out. You the two-piece is better because you can right. get more yeah. aeration, but I don't use that. And I, well, I, le I learned when I was started writing baking books, I was like, you know, home bakers don't want to, you know, they don't have a staff. It's like, why complicate the situation? Yeah, they don't have dishwashers. They don't have seven and a half inch, you know, square pans. You know, I was talking to this guy in Belgium. He wanted to write a cookbook. I said, well, everything in America has to be in a nine inch cake pan or 23 centimeters right. for people who use centimeters. And he was like, well, that's not, uh, uh, that's not fair. That's not good. I was like, well, you want people to make your recipes. And same with cocktails. Um, I, you know, I didn't want to have recipes that were, you know, 14 ingredients had a you know a quarter a quarter teaspoon of you know, eau de sapin you know you know like the odolangi of cocktail books <laughs> well you know he's a little you know you can have cinnamon on the shelf you know, cinnamon doesn't cost that much or you know not or zatar, or zatar. Or something. but having you know someone telling someone well they need like to buy a ninety dollar or ninety euro bottle of liquor to put a quarter teaspoon in a cocktail. You know, and I do have some, you know, there's a few cocktails that have a touch of absinthe in it. Um, and it kind of really makes it special. But mm. I really avoided too many recipes that, um, or any recipes really, that most home people you know, who couldn't make at home. Um, so. You brought up um, Morgenthau. And I was wondering, <laughs> did you know all these people beforehand through your work as, Not a, at all. as a chef? Not or at all. Are, were these all new names and new there were uh, people friends. I sort of heard about. Um, a friend of mine actually said, well, Jeffrey Morgenthaler's really into you. When I was going to start the book, he goes, he's always like making your recipes when he gets home from work. He likes to cook. And I was like, what? I was like, Jeffrey Morgenthaler. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we started corresponding a little bit. And But same with other bartenders. Um, there's a woman here in Paris. She has a bar called Combat. Combat. Mm -hmm. And I saw her at a demonstration. She was amazing. I never saw anyone shake a cocktail like that. And I probably never will again. Um, her name is Margot. And I just remember being in awe, sitting in this audience, watching this woman. Um, and uh, what was interesting was she was being asked a couple of questions that were really sexist by the oh, moderators. Okay. Um, and she answered them so well. She was like, you know, she had brought a woman who she works with to help in this the moderator said, oh, are you making a political statement? Oh, boy. And she said, no, actually, I'm bringing the most competent person on my team. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it was great. And um, I reached out to her. Uh, you know, I, I sort of wrote, you know, this tentative message. Like, hi, my name is David Leibovitz. I write cookbooks. And, you know, she's French. I wrote it in French. And she wrote me back. She goes, oh, yes. And then I went there. And I was so in awe of her. But she's actually just this lovely, really cool person. Um, and I didn't realize she spoke really good English. She goes, she starts speaking English. I'm like, wow, you're amazing. 
Um, but and I'm still in awe of her because um, it's funny because I think, oh, you know, you must know everyone in France. You know, everyone no. must know you, and it's it's all you know. Mm. Is it? You know, <laughs> it's always changing, um, and I'm always just I'm I'm actually impressed by talent. I'm. You know, I'm respectful of people who are talented. There are people that know some of the great chefs here and they, you know, call them by their first name and print. They're like, oh, so-and-so, you know, is my friend. Oh, yeah, my pal. And mm -hmm. I never do that. I say Chef Meder for mm -hmm. Romain Meder at the Plaza Atine Hotel. It's it's just a respectful thing. Um, it's, maybe it's just a French thing as well. I don't know. Um, but I respect all these people and they respect me too. I think, I hope. <laughs> I'm sure they do. <laughs> but it is funny, you know, when you move to a foreign country, mm -hmm. as you know, I mean, you live, England's a little different because you don't have to think about the language because you've got, you got that. Right. You know? France, all of a sudden, you're a two-year-old. Like, nobody can understand. I didn't speak any French. No one could understand me. I didn't, I couldn't talk to people. I had a partner who I had no idea what he was saying. You know, we were dating. <laughs> and the first date, I was like, I love you. And I had meant to say, I like you. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, stalker, you know, American right. stalker. After the first date, right? Yeah. So I was like, whoa, 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 we need to slow down. And I'm like, no, I like you. It's like, it's good. Mm. Je t'aime is, I'm, I love you. Je t'aime bien is, I like you. So, you know, I was jumping the gun a little bit there, but we've been together say, 18, 18 years now. So, I, I, and what did he think of um, of this? Did you introduce him to a lot yes. of the spirits? That... Um, when I started doing the book, he said, "You know, I never liked cocktails because I always thought they were vulgar." Because in oh, France, yeah, there's sort of a you know, there's there's a lot of bad cocktails. Um, if you go to like a a cafe on the corner and they have a cocktail on the menu, it's not it's usually not going to be good. It's not a you know. It's a, you have to go to like a cocktail bar where people know how to mix a cocktail. So you can get great aperitifs, you can get great wine, so forth. Um, but he's and like, guess, these are really good. Yeah, and I guess the cocktail culture or renaissance is really about 10, 15 years old. I mean, yeah. unless you went to the hotels, like the Ritz, the Hemingway Bar, mm -hmm. or I guess Cost, or you yeah. know, even that is kind of young, mm -hmm. or, or Harry's for Bloody Mary, yeah. or... You know, which was invented in Paris. Yes, yeah. that's why I'm well, okay. working on that. <laughs> I know you know. No, wait, that. wait, wait, wait. Um, that really, it's with the Experimental Cocktail Club mm -hmm. and the Red Door, and Ca I'm going to pronounce this wrong, but Candelaria. Yeah, I Candelaria. Said, Candelaria. Yeah, that's okay. I, see, it's the Italian. <laughs> okay. Speaker in me. Candelaria. Yeah. It's uh, it's Mexican Candelaria. Mexican bar. Yes, yeah, so that's why I'm pronouncing it wrong. Yeah, it's well, not that's Italian. Okay. Um, there, you know, you didn't really have an opportunity to go out for a cocktail unless you're going to a hotel, really, or, right. you know, a fancy right. place. So, and wine is everywhere. So why yeah. not just drink that? Yeah. You know? And people, yeah, people don't drink, I mean, cocktails, a lot of them were invented in France, but a lot of them were invented by or for Americans because we came here during Prohibition mm -hmm. to have fun and fun we had, you know, it's like, let's drink. So. Right. And then, okay, back to the cocktails, the yeah. Bloody Mary, the mm -hmm. sidecar. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Was the French 75? In, I don't yeah, know it was, it was named invented after, in France. Yeah, it was named after like a French uh, part, like an uh -huh. engine part. Right, the, uh, yes. An airplane part. Um, and also the Boulevardier. Excuse the Boulevardier. Yes. The, well, which for like, American here, which I hear is one of your Yeah, favorites. that's my favorite. And yeah. what's, what's funny, it's the first recipe in my cocktail chapter I noticed that. I was going to ask yeah. you about that. Well, a few months ago, people were calling it the the cocktail of the year. They were like, the Boulevardier is the cocktail for Thanksgiving. This is in November. And Helen Rosner of The New Yorker wrote a whole article about it. I'm like, wait, wait, my book's coming out in a few uh -huh. months because I love the drink too. Um, it's a great it's cocktail. It's not the cocktail of last year. It's a cocktail of 2020, March 2020. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't do trends so well. Um, so it's a great cocktail. Yeah. And I, I love Manhattan. Like if I had, you know, Probably my desert island cocktail is either a Manhattan or a Boulevardier. You're bourbon, bourbon fan. Uh, well, I, I you know, it was, it was funny. I was into rye for a long time. And then I went to Kentucky, as we were talking about before we started. And I, they were like, rye, oh, yeah, get out of our state. Um, they made get me out of Manhattan town. with a bourbon. And it was great. Um, mm -hmm. And French people don't really love bourbon because it's sweet. Um, it's naturally sweet, saying you know. It's not like I always think it's the American me who likes the bourbon. You know, they love whiskey. The French are the number one uh, drinkers of whiskey in the world per capita, which is unbelievable know, if you think is. about it. And there's whiskey made here and so forth. They love single malt scotches, 
which are, you know, that's a heavy duty commitment. You have a good cla- mm-hmm. you know, a really peated scotch, but they like those. Um, rye whiskey is a little harder to find and bourbon. Was, was it difficult to pick which cocktails to put in? your book and which to leave out? Um, it was actually difficult to stop putting them in because <laughs> when I turned the book in, my editor sent me this message like, yeah. uh, there was only like 15 cocktails on the your proposal and now there's 50. Like, It's going to be a long book. <clears throat> yeah, well, we incre- ended up increasing the size of the book by 30%. To, because there uh, are a lot of recipes in it. A lot yeah, of cocktails. 160 recipes. recipes. Yes. Um, and some people think it's a cocktail book. You know, they're like, your cocktail book, your cocktail book. And it's not just cocktails. There's cocktails, but like there's a whole chapter on homemade infusions and in drinking French. Um, how to make your own creme de cacao or cherry liqueur or vermouth. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, well, I can't just give these recipes to make these things without recipes to use them. So I invented cocktails to go with like the cherry liqueur or pine uh, pine gin uh, sapin. Right. Uh, no, I, yes, I yeah, wrote that down. Yeah. Yes, that sounded so interesting. Yeah, it's very, and I love that flavor, martini. I, yeah. And it reminds me of, I know this is in French, mastica. Oh, yeah. We, you yeah. know, which has that pine flavor. Yeah, the resiny. Kind of the resiny thing. came from a tree. Yeah, and it works yeah. well. Um, but I, le- you know, I learned a lot from the book, too. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was talking to a cocktail writer in New York, Robert Simonson, and he said, well, you know, the martini that. might have been a glass of vermouth with ice over ice, named after Martini and Rossi. Right. Nobody really knows. And then it evolved to what it is today. Um, and what it is today is also completely changing. Um, all, all the time. You kind of no drink. Yes, there's the classic serves, but mm. there's so many riffs on, just like you said, with the different, um, uh, when you went to the dive bar. Mm-hmm. Or, or or trying the different um, the overhauled the different rise yeah. written house and how that makes a different Manhattan, right? You and, know, and what's interesting is that in a, in gin French vermouth is really the choice dry vermouth. They used to you know just call it French vermouth in cookbook and recipe books rather bartending books you know in the thirties forties because that meant dry vermouth mm. French vermouth. So there was Dolan and there was. Um, Noily Pratt. Right. And there was others in Chambéry. There was, I think, five or six vermouth. You know, it was vermouth de Chambéry. That was an official designation, AOP or AOC um, designation. But now there's only one or two. And they don't use that anymore, the designation. So that changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, you know, you said you didn't think of this as a cocktail recipe book. Right. I think that all of your books, they're not simply right. cookbooks. They're, yeah. you know, a little bit of you and, or you are letting us into your life. And I think mm. that's why people are so attracted to your blog mm. and you as a writer. And you really feel when you're, I'm not, <laughs> when, yeah, sorry, a little bit of, of, of star lost here. Um, you really feel that, um, we get to know you Mm -hmm. and it doesn't surprise me that people email you and say, you know, where can I eat where you eat? Because you really let us in with, or with those books. So thank you. I mean, it's, it's, well, you know, with the internet, with blogging, Uh you know, I'm a blogger. I was one of the first, you know, so I'm responsible in a way, but you can find almost any recipe you want online. People are looking now for trusted people. You know, if you're looking for a hotel, people, like you said, people write to me. They're like, there's all these lists online. Where should we, you know, we don't know where to eat. They want a, a voice. You know, you write about London. You do cocktail tours, I believe. Yeah. And, you know, people want, they can do that on their own. They can sit there and, you know, make a list and then use Google Maps. But they want to, they want your expertise. And they people want to hear me. Um, and I like doing this. I like explaining French culture. And I actually, you know, I also, when I started, people were like, wait a minute, this isn't like complimentary. You're not, you know, everything, people used to fawn over Paris. It was like, oh, Parisians, everything is beautiful. Everything's perfect. I'm like, well, I just opened my door and there was a big pile of dog do, right? And, you know, someone let their dog, you know. Or so, you got a mortgage <clears throat> and you had to give a urine sample. Right? Yeah, exactly. Right. So those kind of things, you know, they're not insulting. It's just they're real just life. just the way it is. And, I, you know, French people actually don't like often that sort of, they call it uh, carte postale, uh, 
postcard Paris, <laughs> that sort of Disney, like, oh, everything is beautiful. All the women are thin and chic, and they know how to tie their scarf. So it's very interesting for me to explore their culture. Um, and now it's my culture as well. And the longer you live somewhere, also, you understand, you know, you've been living in London 15 years. I've been living here a little longer. You know, I used to be like, oh, they're on strike, ah, you know, and now I understand. Um, I'm, you know, more much more involved in society and daily life and issues. You know, and we're super lucky. You know, I can go on, on train we're and fortunate. be in Paris. Yeah. Fortunate. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, we're super fortunate. <laughs> you know, I, I came here this morning on a train and I yeah. can go home this evening on a train where a lot of people you know, this is their one lifetime trip to Paris and they right, feel that they right. don't want to get it wrong. Exactly. And so they look, I look to you for mm. restaurants and I've lived in Europe and been to Paris a lot. Yeah. You know, I they want to make sure that everything is right, you yeah, know, well, as much uh, as it can be. Well, and, I was in Vietnam last year and I sort of went online to look at lit restaurants and everything turned up TripAdvisor. Yeah, and you know, tough. you just look at the picture. You know, you look at the picture. You don't you know, all these reviews, and you don't know who's reviewing it. And not to say, you know, everyone a lot of people have good opinions, but you don't know. And there's an algorithm they're using to move people, you know, certain restaurants mm -hmm. to the top of the list that TripAdvisor uses. And it's, so you're not getting an accurate. Um, I have a list on my blog of restaurants and pastry shops. And people will still write to me and they go, where should we want to, it's a very special anniversary. Where should we eat? And I'm not what giving the them, yeah, I'm like, there's a list, you know, they're all places I like, but you choose. Yeah. You choose. I don't want to say, cause you might not like it. Mm -hmm. You might not mm -hmm. like. Uh, and now everyone's going to ask you for your list of cocktail bars. Um, well, they're all listed. A lot of them are listed in the book. Um, you know, it's hard to say a favorite bar cause one bar might be fun to have like a martini at. Another one might be fun for classics. Another, you know, the bartenders in bartenders change jobs. So, of course, of yeah. course. So, should we go find some place out of your list to have a cocktail? Oh uh, yeah, it's almost happy hour. Or as they say, in, it's funny they say happy hours in France, which is very accurate. It's you know Americans are like we get it wrong. We say happy hour. I know, it's it's and it's always you know a couple hours. Yeah, I'm gonna start calling it happy hours. Yeah, I mean I think it, well in French you don't. Probably, you know, you don't pronounce the S because right, it's right. the end of the word. But, <laughs> but I'm American. You don't pronounce the H either. So it's uh, happy so it's hour. All oh, right. Then I'm going to say it's time for happy hour. Happy hour. Should we go get a drink? <laughs> Absolutely. Right. I cannot thank David enough for taking the time to meet me in Paris. We met at Dirty Lemon, who opened their doors to us early to make this interview happen. Ruba, the owner, was on hand to tell us a little bit about its concept and how she and David both met. So Dirty Lemon um, at its core was really to create a, a concept that is uh, very entrenched in the in male dominated milieu, which is the bar a cocktail world. Um, and I wanted to create something from a woman's point of view. So really something that's sophisticated and chic, but still down to earth, uh, very welcoming and inclusive and uh, really create something that everybody can enjoy and Basically, to turn something on its head, something that's very traditionally masculine, but give it on from another point of view. And how did you both meet? Uh, she was cooking at a cafe in Paris, and I ordered lunch, and this food came out, and it was incredible. It was Middle Eastern food, very fresh, but, you know, Middle Eastern food isn't necessarily well represented um, as good. You know, I've been to the Middle East, and you have food there, and I was like, oh, this is as good as this food, you know, freshness, and everything was alive and seasoned and flavorful. Um, and then Ruba left and she was sort of doing her own thing for a while around town, different places, pop-ups. And then she landed here, which is very close to where I live, fortunately for me. Oh, yeah, <laughs> lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> and what kind of cocktails? Tell me a little bit about your cocktail menu. So our cocktails are based on seasonal fruit and vegetable fresh pressed juices. So we're, we try to play off of the seasons and uh, make something that's simple yet refined. So something... Uh, accessible but really tasty and well done fantastic i can't wait to try one and it Me changed too. your menu changes every yeah every, every three season. months yeah every season yeah yeah fabulous well then i can come every season yes please, please, right? please all right i'll yeah. see you at the bar then yeah great thank you all this chat about drinking in france made me thirsty for a french drink i pulled out my copy of drinking french and just had to begin with the one name for the capital, but was born stateside. 
a little like David. How could I not pick the City of Light as our cocktail of the week? It's the nickname of Paris, after all. Even though it was conceived by Christian Rulich, the head bartender at Luke's Restaurant in Los Angeles. First start by laying the garnishes, half a lemon wheel, half an orange wheel, and two thin slices of cucumber in the bottom of a footed goblet or large wine glass. Then add one and a half ounces or 45 mLs of dry vermouth, one ounce or 30 mLs of Lillet Blanc or Vin d'Orange, and then one ounce or 30 mLs of Cointreau. Fill the glass two-thirds full with ice, stir briefly, and top off with one ounce or 30 mLs of dry Prosecco or Cremant. And then, as the French say, salut! You'll find this recipe, more vermouth recipes, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. My first trip to Paris began well, a private dinner at Versailles with my parents and a load of international doctors. My dad had been invited on a medical conference, and I joined my folks before slipping into Florence for a semester abroad. What may have started off well turned into the worst food poisoning I've ever had for the next four days. However, this did not deter me from trying Angelina's famed hot chocolate, dinner at La Serre, and press duck at Claude Therese, the Tour d'Argent. I am a professional after all, even at that young age. If you live for Lush Life, would you consider supporting us by buying us a coffee? Just go to buymeacoffee.com slash Lush Life, and you can donate once or monthly to make sure we are still here every Tuesday. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly. Okay, that second part was mine. So, next time on Lush Life, we meet a Frenchman living in London who is where it all started so many years ago. Until that time, bottoms up. <laughs>